Joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast uh, to talk about their latest draft pick, who everybody is, some people were excited about beforehand. Some people are, are talking themselves into. Um, I, I think you're going to have even more of a reason to be excited about uh, Mr. Toppin after you hear this conversation I'm about to have. Um, he goes by Sully. Uh, he is a UD graduate. He's a podcaster extraordinaire. Most importantly, perhaps he's a Steelers fan, which I love. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> Dan Sullivan, how are you doing, man? Doing well, bro. It's uh, it's great to be on this show. It's it's kind of funny. Like I never, I never considered what was going to happen when Obi got drafted, and then a couple people have reached out to me in Knicks land over the last couple months. Um, <laughs> I did a spot similar to this for Knicks fan TV. I think it was on YouTube. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I never, I, I literally just never considered like, oh yeah, people are going to want to hear stuff about Obi and they probably don't know anything about him because I can't imagine there's a ton of crossover between like Knicks fans and diehard A-10 basketball fans. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, so Knicks fans, obviously we start looking forward to the draft basically when the season starts, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, and I think Obi I mean, he was a, he was a consensus top 10 prospect when the season started, right? You remember better than me, probably. Yeah, well, I would say among draft experts, he was definitely, um, you, you know, like guys like Matt Babcock to follow the draft, right? Sure. I, I had him on my show a couple of months ago, and he was like, I knew going into the season that Obi Toppin was going to be like a top 10 pick. And he said, I was on press row with some people. And they knew I'd been very vocal about him. And they said they gave me some crap. They were like, hey, like you got a lot on the line in Maui, you know. And yeah. he said, I went back to those guys after Maui and I did the I told you so, you know, because <laughs> like, you know, Maui this past year was really like when he broke onto the scene. And, and frankly, like, I think it's when everybody, even inside the fan base, kind of caught wind of our team. And I remember. Okay. My dad's a UD graduate. He's uh he's an old time basketball fan. He's watched Flyers hoops his whole life. And he was the first person to be like, he's like, son, like this team's legit. He's like, this is a legit <laughs> team, man. And you know, it was because of Obi, bro. He kept it, he kept it moving all year. I I was looking at your Twitter feed and I'm like, it it the thing that resonated with me the most is the fact that like you guys universally took ownership of this kid. Um yeah. as, oh, we as, got. <laughs> no, but that's I mean, I, again, I would make a comparison to something with the Knicks over the last few years. We haven't been able to take ownership of much. We we yeah. take ownership over guys like Frank Nilakino, who I don't even know if you know who that is. But yeah, well, I do now because I've been doing these shows. I've been look up and down the Knicks roster. So yeah, there you go. Uh, you know, we take what we could get. Um, but like you guys, you guys literally like it seems like you really love this guy, and I, I think that's a, as good a place as any to start. I mean, it's. Look, his game is, and we'll talk about his game, but like, what is it about him that resonated, you know, with this fan base so much? Um, it, it's his personality, man. And and it was the whole team. Like, I'll kind of, I'll kind of like try to, I'll try to set the table for like how this all came to be. Like, please, you know, you know how like in 1980, um, it, when the U.S. hockey team beat the Soviets, it wasn't as much that they won the game. I mean, it was a big upset, yeah. but a lot of people forget that like the context surrounding it was big, you know, like the Soviets were going to come out of the, the Olympics. They were going to cancel Olympics. Right. And then like leading up to that, you had the Iran hostage crisis. Like there was all these little things where people were kind of like losing faith in America. And then they mm. had like this galvanizing force to be like, Hey, like, you know, we're still going to be all right. We're still America. Right. And, and I hate to just be like, so grandiose with my example. Like I'm going full cow herd here, but here, I here, love here. grandiosity. I do yeah. it every week on the show. It's fine. <laughs> So, I mean, that's exactly what the Dayton team was to the community last year, because, um, you know, you remember, of course, there was their shooting, the, the big yeah. shooting they had last year in August. Um, then there was a tornado that spring that came through and ripped out an entire section of Dayton. Um, and then there there was another um, shooting that happened, you know, over the course of the year. So. Uh, it was a long way to say, man, the context around how Dayton got good was just as important as the team's success, because I think the city was just so ready for like a reason to feel great again. And um, and that's what Obi and the team gave them. Like, so the team holistically wow. was was very much that. Um, but Obi specifically, I know that that's kind of the lens that Knicks fans care about. Um, it, it's the personality, man. It's just like who he is as a guy. Um, you can tell that like his mom raised him right. You know, mm -hmm. like he's, he's definitely the type of kid that got 
hit upside the back of the head a few times, you know, for, <laughs> for acting out or whatever. But um, you can just tell, like, he's from good people. He is good people. Uh, he treats people right. And, and I'll say this. I never heard a single bad word about any encounter that any person in Dayton had with Obi. like never, not once. Um, and you know, when you get kids that are like that, 21, 22 years old, they're rising stars, you know, they're starting to be really famous. Um, you, you guys know as, as good as anybody, like even in the NBA, like guys get really famous and then their, their game goes to shit or, or whatever. Yeah. But that just never happened with Obi. He was always like yeah i'll take a picture with you like you know always take some time for the fans um if you scroll back through date and twitter last few months of the season there was pictures of him with everybody's babies and um our beat reporter david jablonski even he has like a two-year-old son I, he it, told me this story this is crazy that you're bringing this up too. Yeah, yeah exactly so if you heard on the pod before i mean ob like he's that kind of guy i mean it, it bears repeating because it's like if there's a baby in a, in a stroller over there like he's gonna go make faces at it you know he's he's a guy you want to be around he, he just i never found him as polarizing he was always just like such a great face for the program and um you know when you have a leader that that is that way like like i'm gonna give one more example before Please. i on this yeah, yeah i yeah. love it so the, the last thing i'll say is like um, I'm a big Steelers fan I'm from Pittsburgh and, and all the teams that won Super Bowls about 10 years ago, they all said that the defense was so strong because their best player never was like asking for the limelight. It was Troy Polamalu. Troy Polamalu like wore fucking New Balance shoes. He drove a Camry to practice like he was a no frills, like no BS type of guy. And so the rest of the team said, well, if our star acts like that, we're not going to go out and act like like we're some hot crap on the field, you know? And, and that's how it was with Dayton. Because they had a star that set the tone, who was a great guy, the rest of the team was like, well, we're not going to like act big time because we're not even the best player on this team. So yeah. I, I think that was really like all those components, man. You know, you got the city was looking for a reason to be happy. You got a guy like Obi who is just – like just, he just, I don't know. He just kind of exudes a certain personality of like happiness and he loves where he is. Um, and then, you know, him setting that tone for the rest of the team. I think all three of those things as a factor kind of led to us just loving the guy. And, and he's really, you know, it's, he's going to be our dude forever, man. And uh, look, I, I'm not, I don't put the, put the wool over my own eyes. I, I know that look, when you end up on the Knicks, um, there is some trepidation uh, amongst the fan base. It has not, um, We've not had a great couple of decades, um, but I think part of that is because we've never and RJ Barrett. Like, look, we'll uh, you know I, your podcast about college sports. You you know all about RJ Barrett. Sure. We'll see what he becomes as an NBA player. I think everybody, I, at least I knew he wasn't going to come in from day one and have the on court impact. Um, we'll see. His I think his personality is something that could resonate. Um, how I, I think everybody's curious to see can Obi come in and it sounds like he has the personality, but does he have the game that will translate from day one? And I'm thinking back to, and I'm pretty sure this was after Maui, the, the Georgia game. It was like the fifth game of the season. Maui, uh, Maui was Georgia, then Virginia tech. And then okay. Kansas. Yeah. So the, so the, then the first, so then the first Maui game, I was watching it the other day. He came out and obviously he knew, every NBA scout was there because Anthony Edwards was in the building too. Yeah. And he put on a show within the first five minutes of that game that I don't, I don't remember another college basketball player doing what he, like he completely, he, he took his fist and he took out their soul. Um, yeah. yeah. Like Indiana Jones style. Yeah. What do you think? Like, let's talk about his game a little bit. How do you think that's going to translate to the next level? Well, I think that the one thing that I am always quick to point out from the jump, if Nick's fans are like kind of hesitant to believe he's going to take his game to the next level or whatever, um, he couldn't possibly be better suited to do that. And what I mean by that is like Anthony Grant's an NBA guy. He runs an NBA style offense. And you'll you'll hear guys that do college basketball commentary. They say that. Obi, they think he's going to be ready for the NBA because of that factor. And if you watch our games, you know, if anybody goes back and watches the film, we do run kind of an NBA style offense. It's an inside out, a lot of spacing, a lot of passing, a lot of movement. And, um, you know, like the NBA has kind of moved right from that, like ISO ball to exactly what we're talking about. Oh yeah. And, and the reason is because of guys like Obi, like big, long athletic wings who can shoot three, who can rebound, 
you know, that's kind of where the game's headed. So I really haven't had much hesitancy about him making that jump into the NBA for that reason. And then, of course, it's compounded by the fact that, like, he should be a college senior anyways. He took a year of prep school, then he redshirted, then he played two years in Dayton. So he's 22 years old. Like, if he was, like, uh, the first thing I can, first one I can remember is Tyler Hansbro because he went all four years. Mm -hmm. He came out, he was 22, same age, right? So um, I think those two things are going, you know, in the right direction for you guys, or, or they certainly point to being optimistic about him making an impact day one. Yeah, no, it certainly he's not scared of anything. Um, that that was such a big moment, and he came out, and when he did that, I was like, oh my goodness, um, this is this is real. Yeah. But like, it doesn't seem like he's getting to his head either, which will serve him well because if he is successful here in New York, you know, to you know, that's kind of sent a lot of guys down the wrong path. Um, as a playmaker, um, I, I like. I could not get enough of his passing this year. I know everybody's really excited about three pointer. I believe in the shot. I think the touch is there. Um, Do you, you know, how much of the offense went through him? Actually, maybe that's the best way to put it. The entire offense was based around him, like point blank. Like everything they did was how do we exploit the matchup with Obi? And then, you know, further down the season, how do we take advantage of all the attention that they're giving Obi? And I'll tell you, like you said, you've, you've already kind of had a good eye for it that you brought it up. I equated Obi to like, um, like a center and a hockey player, like hockey players, like the one thing that they're super good at above any other guys in other sports is that they anticipate what the next move is because they have to, the game just moves a lot faster, right? You got to know where the puck's going before you even get the puck. Yeah. And Obi is a lot like that on the basketball floor. And you, you saw it last year, like, he did so many passes where he just switched the entire floor and would like throw it over his head point blank into some dude's hands. Yeah. And he knew what he was going to do with the ball before he got it. Um, So like that will obviously translate extremely well into the NBA because, you know, the game moves faster up at that level than it did at college. Um, But that's definitely something that shines that a lot of people don't talk about because it's so easy to talk about as dunks. Um, But, you know, the I mean, they're impressive. (laughs) Yeah, they are. They are. Yeah, (laughs) they're they're pretty impressive. Like he seems like he enjoys like throwing it down on guys, too. I will say absolutely. I mean, have you seen his dad? He was a street baller and that was what he did. He was called Dunker's Delight. I talked about uh, we brought up the dad on the on the last podcast. I, I but I need to go like find some tape of that guy because I there is not. yeah it's out there. Just search Dunker's Delight on YouTube. Dunkers it's Delight. out there. Yeah. Okay. But um, but yeah, you know the the passing was definitely something that stood out as the year went on. But you know to answer your question, like everything Dayton did went through Obi. Um, you know, the way that Anthony Grant designed the offense was so it went that way. Um, and, and, you know, it was smart. Like when you exploit all of the best traits of your best player, it's probably going to work out good for you. And, you know, the other thing that obviously helps in the college game is playing in the Atlantic 10. He was the best player on the floor every single night. Sure. Every every game that we played in, I would say like even the Kansas game, like he was probably a better player than Dotson, even though Dotson went off that game. Mm-hmm. And, and as a book, he's a better center than him, but he's not a better all around player. So like in that breath, yeah. he really was the best player on the floor pretty much every game. I mean, you could say Anthony Edwards, but like Dayton shut him down and Obi went for like 22 or 24 that game. I mean, they cream Georgia. Oh, Obi, oh, like again, that game was over in the first five minutes. Yeah, it was. It really was. Um, I'm looking it up now. The first 10 minutes of the Georgia game, we were up 26 to 10. Obi <laughs> finished with 25 points on seven for eight shooting from two and two for three from behind the arc and and five for five from the charity stripe. You love to see fundamentals out of the boy. I uh, yeah. Oh, listen, we have a coach now that apparently fundamentals mean uh, a thing or two uh, to to him. Um, that. Yeah. Right. Uh, again, we haven't had it in a while, so we'll take it. Yeah. Um, so a couple more and then we get chat here. Uh, he, uh, Obi was interviewed, I think for the ne- our local television network and um, was asked like who he compares himself to or who does he want to emulate his game after? And I guess everybody was anticipating. He would say Amari Stoudemire. He, he just took Amari Stoudemire's number. That's been like the lazy comp. Although I don't know how lazy it is. Um, and he said, Anthony Davis, which I find encouraging. And I find interesting, yeah. which immediately leads me to believe like, okay, he, and he says he knows he needs to get better on defense. You, you can't tell about a guy's defense unless you watch him every game. You watch them every game. There's like, it, look, you know, we know his defense needs work. Is the effort there? Is it just like he just needs to kind of 
grow into his body some more? Like, where do you see improvement coming from? Or do you see improvement coming on defense for him at the next level? Yeah, I mean, I've done enough of these now where I've talked draft experts and and guys around the NBA. And and that's really been the big knock is like his defense. You know, how is he going to take the defense to the next level? I I would say his effort to learn and get better will trump everything, honest to God. Because, you know, he's he's shown such improvement in these last two years. Like he went from a nobody zero star recruit to what he is now in pretty much three seasons. So you can look at that and say, well, that leads a lot of promise for improving other parts of his game. And the one part of his game that does the improving his defense. But you know what? As I watch Dayton games, and I haven't really gone back to look at a lot of the film because I, I don't know, the, the hurt's too bad. Like the season yeah. is canceled. So I'd rather not. I just leave those for you That's guys fine. to go. Yeah, That's you can okay. go sift through the tape. But um, no, I mean, like, I'm not going to say that there wasn't an emphasis on Obi playing defense this past year, but it wasn't like really what Anthony Grant wanted him to do anyway. Okay. Like that, you know you you watch like the dunks you know and, and i hate hate when people will be like oh well look how many easy buckets he got this year it's like well, well did you watch the five seconds that preceded that dunk like yeah, somebody got the rebound and then he beat everybody down the floor to get a fast break yeah. you know so he, you know he wasn't strong on the rebounding end and he wasn't strong defensively because there wasn't just as much emphasis on it like when the ball was hitting the rim it was somebody else's job to grab it and Obi's to get down the floor um, and, and it was the same way when they were playing offense. I mean, we just didn't really have an emphasis on offensive rebounding this past year. But as far as the defense, I mean, I, you know, I never really noticed that he was like so bad on defense until like NBA draft scouts started telling me that. But okay. the other thing that I always got super bothered by is like, why are NBA people so concerned with hips? I've never heard so much talk in my <laughs> life. Everyone's like, his hips, this his hips, that I'm like, what are you people talking about? Like, did I miss out on some memo that like your hips are so, like this thing now that we're all watching? I, I, I don't know. I think a bit much is made probably of that. Well, yeah, it like almost made people who were idiots sound like experts. And it was like such a detailed take that people thought they were like really yeah. being experts. And I'm like, I think you're just making a lot to do about nothing. Um, give him an NBA coach and an NBA system. And um, I'm sure he'll be fine. Well, hopefully he's going to have that. Uh, we, we'd like to think that we we have NBA level uh, things here in the team. And I think Obi's going to be a big part of that. Um, yeah. Last one. So Dayton, um, you know, I'm not going to ask you whether you think they would have won at all because it's an unfair question. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, I looked. I, 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 I would have bet on them. Um, anyway, yeah. where do where does Dayton basketball go from here? Do you think Obi's you know emergence and the fact that I mean, look, Dayton has a rich tradition. We talked about it on the last podcast. Um, it's not like this was a nothing school, but it you know, it's, it was not this level of national prominence in a while. Um, do you think that's going to change because of the top in or what, where do you see it going from here? It certainly seems that way. Um, we just had the best recruiting class of all time, uh, okay. you know, just now. So, you know, that was something where I said, Hey, you know, we need to start seeing trickle downs of this quickly as a program or else it's all wasted. And, um, and you know, that those kind of opportunities can be extremely fickle in college basketball, especially when you're in like a really precarious position like Dayton is where they're like not a major program, but they're not a mid major either. Sure. Like, Dayton has to capitalize on all of this publicity. Um, And the example I always use because they're in our conference is George Mason. Do you remember George Mason making that final four run? I'll never forget it. Okay. You remember how long ago that was? Um, I want to say it was about 15 years ago. Yeah. And they haven't done a damn thing since then. (laughs) A damn thing. Like they literally have not done anything since then. They've had like coaching turnover and now they're literally just like a doormat in the A-10. And that's what happens when you don't capitalize on those final four runs or whatever. You know, in this case, it wasn't a final four run, but technically I guess we could use it as a measuring. Hey, listen, I... Take yeah. credit. You were, you were number three in the nation when the season shut down. So could have happened. Yeah, exactly. So um, I've been really encouraged that the recruiting class thing happened and Dayton was actually in a really good position for this to happen because we had just renovated the arena. Um, you know, Anthony Gray was in his third year. So he was kind of in like a put up or shut up rebuildings over type of year. And he okay. obviously put up. Um, but I wrote a really long column on the, the website I contribute to a couple months ago where 
I said, you know, if you're not comfortable with like talking about this season or whatever, like you better get comfortable because like, <laughs> this is who we are now. You yeah. know, when you talk to like, when I talk to guys like you or anybody that doesn't really know fans of Dayton, mm-hmm. it's going to be the first thing you bring up is like, Oh, like, sorry about 2020. Like this is who we are as a program. Now the, yeah. the team that didn't get it done in 2020, um, with that in mind, like getting back to like the results on the floor, um, I think Dayton's a lot closer to reloading than rebuilding right now. And, and it's for, you know, it's for the aforementioned reasons. Like we put a lot of different things in place now where this success should be sustained, which is really comforting for me as a fan of the program, my life saying this because <laughs> Dayton, like literally our thing as a program is that we've always been like one step away from, from getting there. You know, like in the sixties, they went to a national championship and then they like kept uh, pushing off the NCAA tournament. Like they always wanted to play in the NIT. And so then down the road that killed them in the seventies, they made a couple of tournament appearances. They couldn't string them together. Never capitalized on that success. Eighties. They went to the elite eight. Two years after that, they didn't go back to the tournament, missed the tournament for six years. Didn't capitalize on that. And then 2010, same thing. They made a tournament missed out for the next five years. The Big East started to be formed and they didn't take Dayton. And Mm -hmm. it's been like all these little things like, you know, decade in, year in, year out, where Dayton's just been one step away from being like relevant every year. (laughs) And I think now we're just about as close as we're ever going to be, man. Well, maybe it's a it's a sign from God that uh, Dayton uh, finds their happy place when the Knicks find theirs. Um, yeah, before, I hope. I hope. <laughs> wouldn't that be wonderful? I'm rooting um, for you. Before I let you go, can you let the fine folks at home uh, know where they could find you and your content? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I'll, I'll ask you one question because I'd love to hear this answer, and then sure. maybe I can just like repodcast this because this is all this is right up my alley. Um, <laughs> But yeah, you can find me on Twitter at Sully, my good name, or uh, my podcast is at Talking Out Loud, L-O-W-D, L-O-W-D loud is our word in Dayton. Um, that's uh, you wear red, be loud. That's our two things. I love it. Um, so yeah, Talking Out Loud is my show. I talk about Dayton hoops every week. So if you don't want to hear about Dayton hoops, probably not the show for you. Um, and I got picked up by ESPN Radio in Dayton. So that was pretty cool. Congratulations, was, sir. Yeah, that was cool. I, I always think it's funny to do a radio show in Dayton from my home in Chicago. That's always really bizarre. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I, so I don't get to know the other side of the fence. Right. And like yeah. Dayton fans, it, it was our night, man. Like you should have seen my Twitter feed. It was going off like we were playing a game. I, I saw, man. I saw. It was great. And you did see that I was like anyone but the Knicks. Um, so I, I'll call it the way it is. I did not want him to go to the Knicks. But, you know, I'm trying to be as fair as I can. The reason I didn't want him going to the Knicks was because I thought that it had the highest probability of him not working out. But okay, now that I've gotten under the hood a little bit, I can at least see where the Knicks are going, right? Like from the outside looking in, they're building a ton of young talent. They're getting rid of a lot of old guys. Like I, I'll, I'll give your listeners a funny story. So I did my Please. radio. Yeah, I did my radio show. I know we're supposed to be wrapping up, but whatever. It's no, listen, do it. listen yeah, yeah. it's my podcast. I can wrap up what I want. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, so on my radio show last week, uh, we, you know, we, it was all OB draft talk because I have to put it out on Thursdays and the draft was conveniently on Wednesday. So I was like, great. I just talked about the draft the whole time. So it was the first time that I had pulled up the Knicks roster. And oh, I was goodness. Like, Why would you do that? Yeah. And I was like, and, and the first thing I was like, <laughs> who is this? Nilla? What? Quinta? I was like, who is that? Like, who are these guys? Because there's always our, like. Our own announcer calls him Nicolina. Don't feel bad. Oh, my gosh. So. I'm going through the roster and I'm like, all right. I said, there's a lot of young guys on this roster. Like, I, I, okay, I get it. And then, of course, Thursday morning, we're we're recording this at like 10 o'clock in the morning and it's releasing at six o'clock at night. And I'm like, yeah. And you know what? I I think having a veteran in the locker room like Taj Gibson will be so (laughs) beneficial for Obi. It'd it'd be a great guy to have and learn from. He's an all effort guy, plays really hard. And then, like, I'm, I'm literally clicking send. I'm sending the file to the radio station. And uh, I see on my Twitter, like Nick's release Taj Gibson. I'm like, son of a, <laughs> you should ask me about that beforehand. Although, although um, there is a, there is a small chance that he is brought back under a different contract. There you um, go. I yeah. will say that I, I'll say this. Um, Obi's success, I think is going to be pretty intimately tied to the Knicks success this season, because the one thing that they do not have, which I've been talking about with Nick fans for seemingly forever, but especially the last week, 
Um, there's no engine uh, on the offense, and yeah. it's tough to be an engine from the four spot in the league. But with a little creativity, and with that's why I was thinking about the ball, the the playmaking, and you know he could handle the rock a little bit from again for that spot. Yeah. I'm excited to see what he could do. I'm excited to see what Tibbs does with him. Um, and I think we just, I think Nick fans would like to see one more guard here because yeah. they, you know, they signed Austin Rivers, they re-signed Alfred Payton, which got a lot yep. of people upset. Um, but I think there's, listen, here's one thing you could go with. There's a new regime in town. Uh, yeah. The clowns that were running the organization, they're gone, mm-hmm. which is a good thing. They have a real front office now. They have a real coach. Um, I, I think there is reason to be hopeful. I'll say that. Yeah, and and I will I will say this like if Nick fans do want our perspective like don't hit don't kill me too bad on like my analysis to the Knicks because like I'm sorry guys I don't watch that many Nick games last year, but um I, I don't a, blame you yeah we no we did a segment I'm gonna now but um we did a segment on my show last week called why it will work and why it won't work and okay. I did the like why it won't work and then my co-host he said all right here's the reasons why I think it's gonna work and it definitely started and ended with. Thibodeau being a defensive minded coach because we just talked about like, that's his one weakness, right? Well, what better coach to be paired up with than the guy that's literally known for his defense, you know? Um, So I'm, I'm hopeful from, from that regard, but um, you know, I was just curious from the other side of the fence, like what people wanted out of the draft, I guess. Cause again, I say this, like, I see what the Knicks are doing. They're trying to get lean on the financial side. They're yep. trying to bring in a lot of guys between like 19 and 25. Yep. And then this year's a wash, get one more draft pick and then go out and hopefully, you know, spend a ton of money in free agency to bring in a couple of stars. Like I get that approach. So, you know, like I said, uh, my question is, is that how you guys see it? Like, no, is that will be one of the pieces. I think puzzle? the, I think how it's seen here is we've we've had uh, a little bit too much experience with uh, looking ahead, and the for smart Nick fans at least right now is a time to be like let's take care of our business this year, let's not look like a a, a clown show, and let's yeah. like we're, they're gonna be bad, but let's look you know competent and bad. Yeah, um, and that's that's really what the mo is, which is why I think some of the signings they made in the last couple of days. As they also made a trade, um, are encouraging because these are like, you know, Austin Rivers and like Nerlens and Noel and Alec Burks are not getting anybody excited, but these contributors. are contributors. Like, they're yeah. competent basketball players, right? And they're not going to yeah. soak up usage from where it should be, which is Obi Top and RJ Barrett, you yep. know, and the like. Um, in terms of what Nick fans wanted from the draft, I think a lot of them were hoping for one of the guards, either Killian Hayes or Kyra Lewis. Um, sure. I personally would have been fascinated to see what the Knicks would have done if Hayes had been there. I think they would have taken top in any way. I think uh, Nick's Twitter would have been a lot more upset. Um, we're like you guys. Uh, I, me, I had come around on Obi because I'm like, shit, I should not look a gift horse in the mouth. This guy is the best offensive player in the draft. Maybe we take him and worry about the defense later. Um, well, other than that, are, he's going to be exciting. Like, well, are I you mean, ready to get back to that? Like, just having somebody that's like marketable. It's because you know? the last two years, it's basically been Mitchell Robinson, who's their center. And I actually I mean. am really, really high on how those two are, are going to work together on both ends of the floor. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think they like Nick fans are like you guys. You guys are starting to talk yourselves into the Knicks. Nick fans are starting to talk themselves into Toby Toppin. I think it's a, it's a match made in heaven. Yeah, I think you might as well, man. It's it's like you got your guy now, and and like I said, the pieces are starting to come together, I think. But I will say this, like when you get your guy in the first round, when you have a top 10 pick, you, you want a guy that's marketable. It's going to put some butts in the seats. And I will yeah. tell you, like, I, I don't know what's going to happen with his NBA career, but I'll tell you right now, he's probably going to slam some balls right through the floor. <laughs> like he's going to cram some jams on Madison Square Garden. So, um, you know, at least from that perspective, you can be excited because if you're going to lose, you might as well have some fun doing it and I think <laughs> he, get, he gives you the best opportunity this coming season and, and like you said he'll get all the minutes he needs so that nick fans know what they have to listen man uh i don't i don't need to see the rookie of the year odds i am yeah. i'm putting a couple couple c notes on uh mr top and when they come out i'm uh i'm excited <laughs> yeah, listen i gotta have something to root for you oh, um yeah, Sully, uh, this was awesome. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Everybody listening out there, um, say one more time where they could find that, that your podcast is name it again because I'm going to listen to it. Yeah, talking out loud, talking okay. out loud at talking out loud on Twitter, L O W D. That's where you can okay. always find me. And then I'm at Sully, my good name on Twitter. I'm always talking Dayton hoops. And right now, 10 and 0 Steelers football. Sorry, New Yorkers. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to apologize to me. Yeah. All right. Uh, everybody out there, thanks for listening to another episode of the show. And we will be back with you with another one very soon. Soon.